Hello and welcome to an episode which deals in developing photographs. The subject expert is Barun Kumar, an experienced photographer with many years of experience. And I am Sakshi Mandwal. Understanding Advertising Photography Comprehending the need and usage of advertising photography Understanding the career of an advertising photographer To learn the history of advertising photography To comprehend the meaning and usage of industrial photography To understand the significance of industrial photography To understand the profile of industrial photographer To comprehend the history of industrial photography Advertising photography is one of the most popular and well-known forms of commercial photography. Advertising photography refers to the art of taking pictures that are used to create awareness of a particular product or service to the public. The photographs are mostly used by the advertising agencies to market a product. Advertising photography can be used to promote any product such as fashion, food, cars, houses, companies. There is a wide range of options to choose from in the advertising industry. When they promote products and services, it increases sales, creates higher customer interest. Over 5 lakh crore rupees is spent on advertising each year worldwide. Advertising can be split into either video advertisement or photography advertisement. In the 1820s, the first permanent photograph was taken and it was during this time that more and more people became interested in photography. In the 20th century, people became aware of advertising photography because of an improvement in technology, which meant the photos could be done quicker at higher quality. During the First World War, photographs were used to advertise and inform potential customers of the benefits of a certain product. Soon after, they found out that photographs could help make products seem more appealing. So after using illustrations to advertise products and services, they began using photographs and found out it was more successful. Using photography in marketing campaigns has grown. It has turned into a vital part of selling any product in the present day. Advertising photographers produce seductive images that are used to support or demonstrate a marketing idea in answer to a photographic brief given to them by a client, a designer or an advertising agency. Advertising photographers produce photographs for use in both local and national advertising. This can involve any subject matter but is often categorized into a still life, portraiture and landscape. Some work is carried out on location but much is done in studios using studio flash lighting and a variety of props and accessories. Some advertising photographers specialize in producing well-lit product shots for use on packaging, point-of-sale advertising and in catalogues. These so-called pack or pack shot photographers are often salaried studio employees, working standard hours, five days a week, with all the benefits that regular employment offers. Other advertising photographers choose to be self-employed and often operate their own studios. They are commissioned either directly by a manufacturer or by an advertising agency to produce high quality imaginative photographs that sell the benefits of a product or reinforce brand awareness. They are generally high profile photographers based in the larger cities who secure new work on the strength of past campaigns. They often specialize in a specific area such as food, furniture, engineering, cars or financial services in which they have built up a reputation for excellence. Advertising photographers continually market themselves through agents who take a percentage commission, personal contacts and other forms of networking. Mm -hmm. 
During the 19th century, photography was used rarely to advertise products or businesses. Some photographic advertisements appeared on trade cards. By 1890s, small informative half-tones in catalogues or periodicals appeared. At the beginning of the 20th century, articles devoted to advertising photography began to appear in photographic journals. At first, because they did not see the interpretative qualities of photographs, admin used photographs exclusively with ad campaigns that employed the directive reason why strategy which lectured consumers on the benefits of the product. When early 20th century advertising psychologist, particularly Walter Dill Scott, demonstrated that consumers were open to suggestion, they provided support for a new suggestive advertising strategy, often called atmosphere advertising. Art directors typically employed drawn and painted illustrations with this new suggestive atmosphere advertising. However, as the atmosphere strategy became dominant around the First World War, some advertisers began to recognize the usefulness of the subjectivity of the soft focus, fine art style of photography. Lagerin Hiller was the pioneer. His style of photographic illustration for fiction in women's magazines advanced the integration of pictorial aesthetics into advertising. Soft focus, dramatic lighting, heavy retouching, combination printing and complex state sets were the perfect visual expressions of the suggestive strategy. Good quality photographic halftones became available around 1890, but Photographs were used only intermittently in advertising imagery until the 1920s. But advertising photography came into its own only in the 1920s. As the advertising industry grew because of the vibrant economy and the national distribution of goods. In 1920, fewer than 15% of illustrated advertisements in mass circulated magazines employed photographs. By 1930, almost 80% did. The advertising industry professionalized rapidly after the First World War. The industry, which had started as space jobbers in the 19th century, added specialists such as copywriters, art directors, psychologists and account executives to agency staffs. The new art directors established professional organizations almost immediately. The New York Art Directors Club, founded in 1920, soon sponsored exhibitions, awards and publications, setting a pattern for similar clubs internationally. The tremendous market for advertising photography provided opportunities for photographers of different aesthetic tendencies. Modernist advertising photography, in particular, blossomed as a fitting symbol for the self-conscious modernity of the times. The Clarence H. White School of Photography led in training commercial photographers to employ the new vision. White began to teach photography in 1907 and in 1914 opened his own school with a curriculum that emphasized design principles and encouraged work in the applied arts. In 1923, Edward Steichen landed two commercial photography contracts to produce fashion and celebrity portrait photography for Condé Nast publications and advertising photographs for the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency. Like Hiller and White, Steichen had been a pictorial art photographer who turned to commerce. Easily the dominant and most highly paid commercial photographer in 1920s, New York, Steichen counted as his clients makers of beauty products, packaged foods, cars, jewelry, soaps and so on. For nearly 20 years, he worked closely with his art directors, often suggesting photographic interpretations of marketing directions. Steichen's work convinced art directors to look beyond conventional uses of photography, pictorialism for romance and suggestion, straight photography for information and reason. Why? He developed a persuasive straight photography style that projected ideals, 
aspirations and obvious fantasies, but made them seem attainable. New York's modernism was no doubt influenced by European innovations. The utopian perspectives and stylistic radicalism of Dutch Tastel, Russian constructivism and German Bauhaus and new objectivity aesthetics all had great influence on American graphic design and advertising photography. The European modernists saw closer connections between fine and applied photography. They wanted to provide good design for all classes of people and they viewed modern photography as a way to affect social change. Though European movements were forged in the 1910s and 1920s, their modernist aesthetics had greatest impact on the commercial world after the 1931 New York Foreign Advertising Photography Exhibition, which showed 200 works from eight European countries. Modernist advertising photography paralleled the modernist impulse in 1930s industrial design, seen most notably in the streamlined styles of the machine age. The 1930s were also characterized by a divergent second trend in advertising photography towards pictures of real life. The economic crisis of the Great Depression triggered talk of the need for sincerity and realism in advertising imagery, but in fact led to overly dramatic vignettes accompanied by hyperbolic headlines. The decade also saw technological progress in color photography. With the advent of commercial materials in the market, particularly Kodachrome in 1935, photographers could make negatives, prints and transparencies with sufficient ease to allow colors widespread use in advertising photography. After the Second World War, there was a tremendous growth in the amount of money allocated for advertising. Consequently, its institutional structure grew with new agencies and publications. The glamour and elegance that often characterized pre-war images of women were replaced by depictions of conventional gender roles and middle-class family life. Although veterans like Victor Kepler continued to flourish for a while, new faces and styles began to dominate advertising photography. Perhaps the two best-known commercial photographers of the post-war period are Irving Penn and Richard Avedon, both of whom, like Steichen, made a name in both fashion and advertising photography. Both men began their careers in the 1940s and continued into the 21st century. Both continued an exploration of photographic modernism, yet developed highly personal styles. Seamless backdrop paper or minimal environments replaced 1930s barrack state sets. Many commentators have noted how the calm elegance of his images tended to objectify the models, turning them into objects like those that populate his product studies and still lives. Avedon's later work simplified backgrounds, isolated figures and scrutinized features. As with Steichen and Penn, Avedon's personal and commercial work overlapped significantly. Commercial photography in the 1960s was perhaps less stylistically unified than in other decades. It ranged from William Klein of Harper's Bazaar, who set mannequin-like models against bold contrasting patterns in the architecture and built environment, to James Moore, also of Harper's, who brought a street photography aesthetic to fashion photography, to General Opsai, who specialized in a more natural appearance of casual outdoor life and family affection, and Diane Arbus, whose art and commercial work played with awkward strangeness. The Japanese photographer Hiro, however, may best express the advertising spirit of the age in his intense color, elegant formal geometry and subtle balance. Advertising in the 1960s saw great emphasis on internationalism, more space for an overlap of personal and commercial styles and greater collaboration with art directors. The industry could not ignore changes in social values and newer representations of gender roles and racial relations took their place alongside traditional ones. A new trend in 1970s and 1980s 
advertising photography echoed the soft romanticism of the early 20th century, particularly in the work of Deborah Turbeville and Sarah Moon. Their ethereal style often revealed frank contemporary attitudes towards sexuality. In the 1980s and 1990s, her Brits produced dramatic narrative images for Donna Karen, Kelvin Klein, and Giorgio Armani. Like his predecessors, he developed a distinctive personal style across his fashion, celebrity portrait, and advertising work. Advertising around the turn of the 21st century provoked new content-based controversies. Where mid-20th century advertising photography was often criticized for promoting overly traditional visions of life or unrealistic material aspirations, criticism of today's advertising has targeted images that glamorize drug use, tobacco, anorexic bodies, or other unhealthy lifestyles. For example, the clothing manufacturer Benetton, during its association 1984 to 2000 with Olivero Toscani, had used AIDS victims, prisoners and refugees in its advertisements. Were these images made to stir social concern or simply to shock? The magazine Ad Busters, founded in 1989, is devoted to such critiques of the advertising industry. The advertising industry turned to photography when it discovered the photograph's power to convey the joys and benefits of consumerism. Advertising agencies, clients and magazine editors eagerly sought work by Steichen, Penn, Avedon and others because they recognized their modernism and distinctive personal visions as effective selling tools. Photography remains the dominant advertising medium and recent scholarly study of advertising photography has helped develop a more complex understanding of the diversity within modernist photography. Industrial photography can be defined as photographic practice that takes place within and or at the behest of an industrial organization to document production processes, products, work organization, employees or the layout equipment or culture of an enterprise. The pictures may serve either internal, example administrative or industrial relations or external, example advertising or public relations purposes. In principle, there is no distinction between images made by in-house specialists or professionals hired from outside and photographs taken by workers or clerical staff. The borderline between documentary pictures and journalistic advertising and public relations once is fluid depending on context and usage in individual cases. Industrial photography is a specialized field of photography which makes it possible for businesses to communicate with customers and other businesses showcasing their industrial process, machines and techniques. The photographs not only need to be shiny with balanced hues and highlights but also need to effectively communicate the meaning of the photograph in less in a second. This is why these types of photographs require a skilled photographer with years of experience photographing industrial machinery, locations and manufacturing processes. An expert will be able to take photographs which are interesting and showcase everything you want from every angle, leaving no questions in the mind of the person looking at the photograph. He or she should have an eye for detail and be able to generate interest out of everyday normal machines. This means that the photos need to be more like a piece of art rather than just specialized images. For instance, an expert will photograph an everyday regular and ordinary conveyor belt in a way which would generate interest by highlighting specific areas and blurring out the background. These images, when laid out on commercial advertising material like a brochure or a PowerPoint presentation, will tell the story of the process. Apart from physical posters and brochures, the right images will enhance your professional image online. 
a website displaying top-notch photographs of every industrial process the business is involved in will add credibility and interest in the mind of the viewer. This in turn will help a business earn a lead, sell a product or be able to improve its image as a business online. Photography of machines and processes for each medium that is internet and print is slightly different. It requires a slightly different approach but an expert with years of experience will know which approach to take in order to ensure that the pictures communicate exactly what the business needs to get the desired result. Industrial photography is serious business and therefore an amateur will not be able to do justice to the same. Therefore, ideally a typical industrial photographer should have a diverse portfolio which would then mean that he is able to take photographs for both website and print campaign. The use of photographs to depict industrial activity and products began in the 1850s and 1860s. Few firms employed their own photographers but commissioned independent operators or employees who could use a camera. Many well-known figures worked occasionally for industrial companies. Carleton Watkins in the late 19th century produced many pictures for mining, shipping and railway companies in California. Albert Ranger Pash repeatedly took on industrial work throughout his career. Margaret Walk White began her career as an advertising and industrial photographer in Cleveland, Ohio. Industrial photography cannot be tied to a particular aesthetic or function. There are innumerable links with other branches of the medium such as portraiture, reportage and architectural and advertising photography. However, it has been particularly associated with certain technical innovations, flash, panoramic equipment and styles. The 1920s were characterized by especially close links between artistic and applied, including industrial photography. Early industrial photography centered not on the individual worker, but on plant, buildings and the workforce as a group. Working people as such Artisans, labourers, farm workers or fisherfolk were indeed photographed from an early stage. The fishwives of New Haven, Scotland immortalised by Hill and Adamson in 1843-1845. However, people in industrial photography appear primarily as part of the production process with the emphasis on the function rather than their individuality. In general, major engineering projects such as shipbuilding, railway construction and large-scale building were photographed earlier more intensively and more often than office work or the production of food or luxury goods. Well-known examples of the photographic documentation and presentation of major building operations are the re-erection of the Crystal Palace in South London in 1857 and the reconstruction of the Louvre in 1855-57, every stage of which was recorded. The construction of locomotives and the building of railway lines with their tunnels and viaducts was another prominent early subject. Particularly well documented was the creation of the first US transcontinental railway completed at Promontory Point, Utah in 1869 photographs of which are amongst the most frequently reproduced examples of classic industrial photography. Less well known but equally spectacular are Mark Ferre's pictures of the nearly finished Paranagua Curitiba line in Brazil 1879 and images of railway construction in British India. Other massive and comprehensively photographed communications projects included the building of Suez and Panama canals and the fourth bridge in Scotland. A special case is mining photography because of lighting problems underground. Especially in coal mining, the dangers associated with artificial light meant that photography began comparatively late at the end of the 19th century, although pictures of iron ore extraction had already been taken in the 1860s. Another problem in mining was the complexity of the workings, the network of shafts and galleries which could not be rendered visually. 
Hence, individual miners were depicted much more often than other kinds of workers. In mining regions, example Cornwall, England, such pictures had a certain nostalgic ethnographic flavor rather than showing a dynamic growing industry. It was sometimes a case of creating a visual record of a centuries old tradition. At the turn of the 21st century, a large corporation may use pictures to address a wide range of publics, including existing or potential consumers of its products, neighbors, environmental groups, shareholders, and its own workforce. Particular events such as strikes or pollution disasters may require the production of extensive visual propaganda. Another variant of industrial photography is workers' photography carried out within the enterprise. In Germany in the 1920s and early 1930s, a social democratic and communist influenced photographic movement developed. It was stimulated by social documentary photography and contemporary work in Russia. However, a distinctive work style failed to emerge, partly because of workers' own self-perception, partly because of the limitations on workplace photography imposed by management. In conclusion, industrial photography is a highly diverse phenomenon. It reflects both the technical and aesthetic currents prevalent in photography, generally at a given time, and prevailing notions of photography's usefulness to industry. The pictures can be read to reveal both the messages intended by their makers and period-specific cultural traits of particular companies and of industry per se. Advertising and industrial photography are creative functions meant to sell products to the consumers on a day-to-day basis. Being commercial, both the yawners still cater to the infotainment appetite of the larger audiences and masses. Both the yawners provide great amount of understanding, knowledge and information on the various types of products available in the market. The explicit variety of emotion and drama in both the yawners led to popularity and demand of both the yawners. It seems that mankind would reap commercial and aesthetic benefits from the aforesaid yawners for today, tomorrow and times to come. That is all that we had for you in this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Till the next time, it's a goodbye.